Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're doing a book club episode with John Andrew Bryant. And it's on uh, the new book he wrote, published by Lexham Press, A Quiet Mind to Suffer With, Mental Illness, Trauma, and the Death of Christ. And so uh, there's a couple forwards in here from previous guests that we've had on. Uh, there's one from Kelly Capic we've had on our show before, and Austin Freeman we've had on our show before that did the uh, book on Tolkien dogmatics. I'll read Kelly Capic's first. He said this about uh, John's book. Our lives are not tidy, nor are our personal stories always a cheery upward and onward narrative. Instead, we often face deep valleys with frightening darkness and endless unknowns. John A. Bryant's book is not tidy either, but because of his experience with and honesty about mental illness and trauma, we can learn from him, more importantly, because he points us to Christ crucified. We have more than a story, we have hope. And then the words from Austin Freeman, he says this, part essay, part sermon, part narrative poem, this book ministers to the clinically anxious. Bryant's message is grounded in the gospel and, uh, and owned through daily practice of what he preaches. Beautiful endorsements from two of our friends um, on our show before. And uh, so if you go to our show notes, Lexham Press, speaking of our friends, they're our friends at Lexham Press. Uh, you click that link and it'll take you to Lexham Press's website where you could order this book for yourself or someone you know. And then other helpful uh, links and resources and reminders on our show notes, uh, just how to communicate with our show, find us, uh, know what we're about, our our website, our confessional podcast network website, um, reminders of how to how to view these on YouTube or listen to us on podcast apps, as well as uh, how to donate to our show and uh, just how to find a local church near you if you need help uh, with a local church finder. And so uh, I'm sure there's other stuff in there that's helpful, but uh, it's escaping me at the moment because I'm so excited to get into this book. And then uh, before we jump in, too, I want to also mention something great about this book is he starts it off um, with Psalm 130, a prayer in the wilderness of a mental illness. And he goes through uh, Psalm 130, even before you get to the forward of the book. So with that said, I'll let uh, Peter further introduce our guest today, John Andrew Bryant. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce to our audience, John Andrew Bryant, who is a caregiver, writer, and part-time street pastor, makes my heart happy, in a small steel town outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he lives with his wife, Becca. Thanks for coming on the show, John Andrew Bryant. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So happy you, I want to, I want to give you, I want to give you kudos. You are quite possibly the hardest person to find on <laughs> <laughs> on any social media on website. Myth, yeah. The only person I could find. Oh, actually, I talked to your wife before I talked to you on Twitter. So I want to I want to congratulate you on yeah. being the hardest person we've ever had to find online. I'm. I'll be honest. I'm honored. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice to be a myth and a, a folk tale and uh, to not have your existence <clears throat> confirmed except by your wife. Um, <laughs> That's right. Your wife's your gatekeeper, which could be which could be a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, she said the power was getting to her head. She's like, anyone who wants to talk to you has to go through me. And I was like, well, that's cool, baby. I'm, you know, that you can do that. I will say, so there there are two people. Actually, there's one person who I thought you might have been, and then there's another person who you couldn't have been. When I looked online, the only two people who showed up for me online, whenever I typed in your name, was John. Some, I forget his middle name, John Bryant, who's a, um, a African Methodist Episcopal preacher. And I was like, maybe that's him. Who knows? Yeah. Um, or it's a guy who died in 1987. And I was like, I don't yeah. think that's him. So yeah, that I, was hard. 1987 was a hard year for me. I, having not existed yet, it was hard to die. <laughs> that's that's <It> right. <laughs> yeah. So if people tried to look you up, those are the two top search results that I found. Um, there's, so. a, there's a weatherman in Memphis, Tennessee, who's 
whose name was was John. I don't know, he may have moved to another country, another okay. city. But uh, yeah, you there may you think I'm him. I'm not. It's uh, so it's the other guy, the know. man, the myth, the enigma, John Bryant. Yeah. Who we found. We, we got you. Well, you're <laughs> out there now. We got you on. You're permanently <laughs> out mean? there. You can get. You can be found on YouTube with these videos and uh, that's, yeah. that's right. podcast. You're, you're so now somebody can actually see what he looks like for the first time ever. Yeah, yeah. here yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. two so eyes, a mouth. Yeah, I got it all. <laughs> he's he's out in the open. So <laughs> beyond beyond just a little blurb from Lex and Press, let our audience know a little bit more about John Bryant. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, well, uh, part-time street pastor is maybe a little confusing. I uh, uh, kind of a what does that mean? I'm I'm an open-air chaplain. Oh, okay. In, um, in a, a downtown area, we do um, ministry of presence. We ca- I call it administering the sacrament of presence. Mm-hmm. Uh, a kind of a relational evangelism in a trauma-informed environment. Um, with, uh, homeless people. Um, well, not homeless people, not so much, but it's mostly people on the street. There's yeah. people in addiction, a lot of people with mental health issues, a lot of overlap with people who've been yeah. traumatized, um, poorly resourced areas. Um, they're also just friends at this point. So it's weird to talk about the work because hmm. uh, a lot of what it is, is just developing friendship with people over time and um, seeing if they want to go back into fellowships of faith and, and being hmm. co- what I hope to be just good company as they make the journey. So I say street chaplain is my main, <laughs> yeah. my main job. Um, it's, it gives me a, a, a lot of joy and, uh, and then I love writing and then, uh, caregiving has been a part of my life for, um, ever since right out of college, hmm. uh, I met my wife at a camp for people with special needs, um, huh. uh, called camp Barnabas. It's, it was a wonderful okay. camp still is, um, taking care of people has been a, a joy um, to me, uh, uh, maybe in ways that are hard to describe and, but it's a, a clear joy, a clear sense of meaning in that work. And it's taught me a lot about Jesus and his care for us and his patience and his sort of, so uh, yeah, those, those three things, taking care of people, um, uh, writing and chaplaincy work kind of make up my kind of work identity, the things I do, my callings. Um, Thank you. Cool. Yeah. yeah so Brings me to uh to this question and and for those who are listening and as I'm sure you know because you wrote it and Nick and I read this this is this is a deeply personal book so I'm assuming when this kind of got out there like oh people may not know me totally but like this is a pretty it's a pretty clear view into my soul yeah. can you talk a little bit about the the background and desire because this is not your typical Christian book so if you want to talk a little bit more about your desire and, and why you wrote this. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's, uh, I had a breakdown in 2019 um, from OCD that I was not caring for well with myself. Um, and uh, it reached a point, I think a lot of people in their late 20s, especially um, issues compound, things that maybe you could use to kind of work mm-hmm. around, um, uh, suddenly you can't. And I, I hit that wall and um, wrote found that writing about it was uh, a means of surviving it or certainly of recovering. Um, and so the book was written as I was recovering. So there's a rawness to the book. Um, it's, it's not a, I'm 10 years out and looking back no, on it. It's, not um, at all. yeah, it's clearly, um, and even now I, I, I finished the bulk of it. And when I was 31, I'm 34 now, there's a distance I feel from where I was at then that there's an intensity to the to the writing that's clearly someone still working through it hmm. and and i felt that was important to keep um hmm. because it is a memoir it mm-hmm. um uh, so what i was finding though was that um uh, writing at first sur- to survive was good um but there were friends that were dealing with ocd um and talking about it with them sharing at first it was an essay before it was a book um, it, it just meant a lot to people. Hmm. And, um, so it became, um, a gift. I, I think of the book as a gift to people who are crushed by an affliction, uh, such as OCD. I, I call it an affliction. I, I think of it that way. And, um, it's, it's a love letter. I, one to Jesus, but two, to people who suffer. And I think part of that is to acknowledge the affliction for the damage that it does and the way hmm. that it, the way that it, it it can take it, it OCD can wants to take over 
mm-hmm. your life and it's a bully in that capacity and I don't speak as a therapist when I say that I speak as someone yeah. who has it so it, it, I yeah. It, I yeah. I feel it as a bully and wanting to be honest with people um who already were experiencing it um as a to say well this is my the, the gift I have is how I'm experiencing it and where I see the Lord working and so it, yeah I um Sometimes I cringe at the vulnerability of the book. I reread it. And I'm like, oh, I, well, I said that. And there it yeah. goes. Um, but looking back, I, I, people have been. No, but it hits different when you read this. You're like, oh, this is like you feel like you can be like, so I'm this is, I'm saying you as in me, like you feel like you can be vulnerable after reading this book. It's like, well, if this guy says this, like maybe I can say what I struggle with, too. Yeah, and that's a hope. I, you know, there's that you don't want to. I struggled with what to share and not to share in the book because um, yeah. you don't want to just bleed out onto the page and you don't want to um, just put suffering so on display that, that it just becomes a, you know, an exhibitionist, you know, yeah, about, true. you know, here's, here's how much I suffered and here's how awful it was. Mm, yeah. So, but wanting to be honest about the symptoms and how they, how yeah. they hurt over time. I was like, and, and, and yeah. And, and, um, wanting to talk about what it's like to have an affliction that's not going away yeah. and mm. is in, in in certain ways here to stay and yeah and being honest about that that was important to me yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and nick nick will actually get into this i'm we didn't actually send this over but i'm i'm curious i'm i'm thinking <clears throat> of our audience right now who's listening and when they hear the term or the OCD. Yeah. Mental, the, the mental disease or whatever people want to call it um, of OCD. My guess is they think like, well, I need to turn the label on the shelf just right. And <laughs> that's what I think OCD is. And they're like, or Oh, lock, that's an affliction. Lock, Are you like, that can't be that bad. Times. Yeah. Or let, yeah. Yeah, lock the door. That's Being like, quirky. that's I think what people yeah. meant people's mental conception of OCD. Maybe if you can describe a little bit, like, what do you, what are you, what, what are you talking uh, about? Well, it's more like hell. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, it's more like, uh, that's <laughs> yeah. I, I tell people if they, I wouldn't wish OCD in my worst enemy. It's, it's, yeah. um, um, without, um, it's, um, you know, your brain's, your brain's lying to you in such a fantastically loud fashion that, that it becomes very hard to navigate ordinary life. And so I said, well, okay, it's, it's not so much, um, that I'm neat or I have a, a desire for things to be in order, but yeah, that's uh, what imagine, people assume OCD yeah. is. Yeah. But it, for me, it's, it's more like uh, imagine you're in a car and the car alarm will not stop going off mm-hmm. and, um, and it's loud and it's painful and you still have to drive the car cause it's your car mm-hmm. and it's the way you get to places. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it, the, the thing about OCD in my experience has been when you stop the compulsions, which is when you stop sort of obeying the, the lies that it's telling you, uh, the alternative is to live with suffering as in your brain is still upset at you for not doing what it wants you to do, not Mm -hmm. responding to its alarm messages. Um, And you sort of learn to live with a brain that's loudly and persuasively misinforming you Hmm. and to sort of move along anyway. But, um, that's a hard thing to tell people what that's like. So I talk about a car alarm going off. <laughs> yeah. I talk about um, just anything that's sort of obnoxious. That's supposed to tell you that there's an emergency, but often there isn't, you know, like a smoke alarm going off, but it's just the batteries out. Hmm. If that thing couldn't shut off and you had to live anyway, live anyway, hmm. I think that gives you a closer experience rather than to know. I like to, you know, I like to be neat and I like to be neat sometimes sure. too. And I like things in order. I'm not saying that those aren't, there's not some truths there, but. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, that's more animal. to like reframe our, <clears throat> our, our brains. Like what, like what are we actually talking about right now? Instead of just, Oh, I'm, I'm a neat person and I've yeah. been, yeah. I've been afflicted by my neatness, which I'm sure that happens, but this is not exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and just a, a, something I've, there's a brain called, there's a book called brain lock that um, that was really helpful for me. And hmm. it showed sort of these scans of the brain of a person with OCD. And what you can see is that, the brain is doing different things than a, a person who doesn't have it. Hmm. And, and what's missing, and I'm not going to go into the science of it and stuff sure. is you're, you're basically missing or malfunctioning the part of you that lets you move on 
mm-hmm. and that lets you know what's actually a danger or not. And mm. so you're kind of, it's like you have a bike, but the the but the uh, the gears aren't working. You can't you can't move on. You're stuck. So they a lot of people experience it that way. But mm. you're kind of you kind of have to make your brain do what other brains do normally. You have to mm-hmm. learn how to make it make it move on. Hmm. And uh, that's my also been my experience. It was really helpful though to see like, oh, that's that's what my brain is doing. It's it's um, actually uh, looks different on a scan than someone whose brain is not doing that. And that gotcha. was like, oh, okay, there's a thing here called OCD that really exists. And gotcha. That was like that was mm-hmm. cool. Gotcha. Yeah, it's like a a form of slavery. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. And it takes time. It's just taken me years. Um, you're. Mm-hmm. you're you know, if if you feel like it's wrong or bad to do, um, to to you know go outside or to to leave things unstraightened or to for a lot of people it's uncertainty. Uncertainty just feels intolerable, mm-hmm. and most people live with uncertainty. Okay, not everybody, but we all we no one likes uncertainty. But yeah. OC people, but you can you sort of move on from the uncertainty a little bit. But OCD people, it's like a lot of people you cannot stand it. It feels intolerable, mm-hmm. and 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 letting uncertainty happen anyway and just living with that feeling of like it's just, my brain's just gonna have to be upset mm. that's man uh, that's it's it's the worst uh, mm. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah yeah gotcha. um yeah and and as we're asking these questions and you're answering them throughout the episode it's gonna peel the onion back and and you're gonna explain more and more how practically it is that you know that you're living with and um so it's educating the audience too, but also people, um, you know, can relate to the book too. I mean, I know I can relate to the book. I don't know. I'm not exactly the exact same experiences and what you have, but like there's, there's points where I'm like, wow, I, I can definitely yeah. see where you're coming from on stuff. And mm-hmm. knowing understanding is such a pivotal, um, point of getting to with, uh, your relationship with Christ through this. So my first question going into this is um, just kind of going in order too, because I'm going to start with the forward of the book. Uh, You already lay out some important questions that this book will help answer. So some things that the reader can expect. So there's a question you say, who is Christ? And you ask who am and who am I? And you ask, where am I going? And what am I supposed to be doing? So my question to you would be, why are these important questions that you cover in your book? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, I know you, you sent over the, some of the questions ahead of time to help me chew on. Mm-hmm. Um, so the reasons those questions became so important is is um, the the OCD creates a, a tremendous amount of, I call it a shrieking fog, it, tremendously disorienting. Um, and you begin to, I mean, it's just not uncommon to believe lies in OCD that if you do this thing, people, something bad might happen, or if you don't do this thing, something, so things, otherwise reasonable people with OCD will find themselves believing things that they maybe on their best day, they know aren't true, but all of a sudden they, they're pretty convinced of, and these worries that won't go away. And that's a, a tremendously disorienting. Um, I talk about, there's a sort of call it a kind of a savage confusion and um and so some a part of understanding who i was was to say okay when i know who jesus is through the proclamation of the gospel whether it be on a sunday or the lord's supper or the preached word or or just i do the the daily office from the book of common prayer i'm hearing promises from christ about who he is and what he offers and the, the the forgiveness and mercy and and then i become the person who receives that i become when I know who he is, I know who I am, and 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 but I need to know who he is by hearing, and um, I need to hear promises again. I need to hear good promises again. I need to hear him. You know, I talk about the forgiveness of sin. He's revealing who he is. He's the yeah. kind of he's the kind of person who dies for us, and so that gives us a sense of okay. Well, then I'm the one who has died for. I'm the one who receives mercy, and that's uh, it helps orient the self when the self is just tremendously being just pushed around by other forces. Um, and then where I'm going and what I'm doing, um, it's if you're wrapped up in compulsions, 
which is what a lot of people experience uh, with OCD experience uh, a compulsion is just a behavior or uh, a sort of strategy to make your brain not upset at you anymore the OCD brain hmm. so if you're sort of obeying those compulsions um when you stop obeying them you don't really know what normal people do um you don't really know <laughs> hmm. uh, it, it it did not dawn on me until i was 30 that other people didn't spend their time constantly going over thoughts in their head and and i mean certainly people that's an experience but i thought everyone was doing that and and sort of that this relentless rumination cycle i did not realize that was not typical hmm. um or and 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 so then we're like well if i'm not thinking all the time what am i doing what am i supposed to do and and that took a long time. And there's actually a kind of a, a grieving process when you lose your compulsions because of how much time they took from you. And, and then you're like, well, all this time I could have spent being in my life. And you're like, yeah, you could have. And it, that's hard. That's time lost. And you grieve that. But there's also like a realization. Well, now, I, now I can be present in my life. It, it's painful, but there's a way. And then that kind of moves us towards, okay, what am I supposed to be doing? What is my life about? What is my day about? If I'm not constantly checking to make sure i'm okay and um i needed that map i needed to know who i was and where i was going because the symptoms weren't going to die down i just needed to but if i could find a way through them if i could head somewhere each day hear good promises and start heading somewhere i can make my way out of the forest of them the, the wilderness of them and that was that was recovery to me is to make my way out of the the or make my way through the wilderness of the symptoms themselves. So, hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah. And there's, so my next question is, uh, there's an objective truth that the, and we all know uh, as Christians, there's an objective truth that the death of the son of God, Jesus has taken on our guilt and shame, our fear and anxiety and the trouble of our souls. And then there's the subjective feelings we all have day in, day out. Uh, the message we often hear from even pulpits and counseling offices, whether intentional or unintentional, um, is when you accept the gospel, it's it's going forward much better. Your feelings go away. You're going to not have to worry about that stuff anymore. Um, kind of a health and wealth prosperity kind of promise. Um, however, throughout your book, you would describe how you wrestled with your feelings. So I want to talk about that tension. Can you go into that? Yeah. I, you know, I found, um, leave it. I would just say, you know, imagine the times that you've had to leave a bad habit and how pain and how hard it was, even if it's just like eating what you shouldn't eat. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And just that feeling of like withdrawal of like the thing that gave what you thought gave life is now the thing you are saying no to, to something else that gives life. And, and that that's a pain that, that involves, you know, a, a painful renunciation. Um, and for me, the, the consolation that I got from hyper, for me, my compulsion was hyper, hyper vigilant rumination, just constant checking in my head to make sure everything was okay. And I didn't have outside compulsions as much. So it was harder to diagnose also, but let's just fair to say, when you give up a false consolation by which you were enslaved to a lie and then move toward actual consolations or act things that you actually can trust, Jesus's word, his promises, his spirit, uh, it sucks. It's just really hard because your brain does not like that. And in some ways you don't like it because you were pretty close to your brain and wanted it to be okay. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there's a loss of things. You're giving up things that that, you know, maybe at some point were were helpful. Like for me, hyper hyper rumination was really great in college. I turned in some great papers because I thought too much and <laughs> was constantly going over them. Yeah. But out in the real world, hyper rumination can become incredibly um, maladaptive um, if you're trying to make decisions and can't make decisions because you're just going over and over and over and and to embrace uncertainty to walk into not knowing for sure to to live by hearing promises rather than checking to make sure you're okay all the time 
I mean, it's just, it's pain and it would be pain, I think for anybody. And I think, um, you know, the discipleship experience of, of, a, uh, you know, <laughs> The Israelites leaving Egypt and they look back and they're in the wilderness. They're like, man, uh, you know, three hots in a cot at, in Egypt. Uh, I don't <laughs> mind it so much. What about, let's talk more about Egypt. I don't mind that. Yeah, like, no, I like no, that slavery, slavery in Egypt and slavery in the wilderness. <laughs> so I, I think that's the way that it's, it's, um, it's felt you sort of moving you and your trust, you, your trust in Jesus are moving against the stream of your body and your mind that are sort of just like craving the old thing. And you're just like, no, we're going to go this way. And gradually your mind and body can sort of turn with you and follow that way. But they're at the end, at the beginning, they're just not happy about the new way of doing things for sure. And um, hmm. that's been my experience. Yeah. Um, somewhat in the similar vein of, of Nick's question, uh, you people might hear, and, and you kind of talk about this, like on the, not the second part, but the second half of the book, especially kind of with some of your church experience, your ordination experience and, and talking to a counselor and whatnot. Um, it's kind of, maybe if it's not directly said, it's like Christians like aren't depressed. Um, they right, don't, yeah. they don't go through some of this stuff. Or if you do, like, you got to get that figured out and then you yeah. can come and serve and then you can come and do whatever it is, which you went through very particularly. So, and so hearing somebody talk about their mental anguish as, as you, as you go into over and over and it's like, it hurts, but it's like, you got it. It's, it's so, it's so helpful reading through some of this stuff. It can be really uncomfortable. You might think, um, am I, am I really a Christian? Like, do I actually believe some of this stuff? Um, why am I not rejoicing? Why? Right. So can you talk about your experience as a Christian and trying to hold on to these truths that Christ died for me, Christ rose for me. Right. Christ has ascended for me, and yet I still have these feelings. How can these two right. possibly be here at the same time? I think especially so somebody who is training for the ministry. Yeah. Oh, it's you know, and I hate I hate that my experience, I, I'm hoping it's not that other people's experiences was different. And you know, and maybe um sometimes I wonder and it's my OCD goes back and goes, Did you remember that what they told you? Did they actually say that? But it was oh, no, some version of once you get better, you can come back. Yeah. Or or once, uh, particularly it was, um, once you get these intrusive thoughts under control, <laughs> which good luck with that. I mean, the whole point is trying to get them under control makes it worse. Yeah. So I, I had an unfortunate interaction with someone who was not an expert on OCD. And, and the grace I give is my peculiar kind of, and OCD is a peculiar among anxiety yeah. disorders and things that are helpful, maybe with, um, that maybe, maybe there is a sense of, okay, maybe you can work this out or, or, you know, but to, for me to be told some version of, you know, once you get a handle on those thoughts you can, I was just like, like well, that's precisely that's, what I've been trying to do. And it hasn't been like, working. That's like, that's how, that's how you end up, you know, my, the, the, the mental counselor. Work. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the, 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 there was a really funny, um, psychiatrist on the on the psych unit and if you read the book guys you yeah. that's where i was um, <laughs> but he um he said oh you're you're here because you try to get rid of your thoughts not because you had them mm, and yep. that was just like man if there was a word of mercy coming over me from a secular yes yeah, so, a non-christian person yeah the same oh, i just felt the weight the weight of the world left off to me and he's like why don't he told me why don't you develop a sense of humor <laughs> and and i said yeah like i'll get on that just you know get get me out of here first i'll be the most the funniest guy you've ever met and um uh, but um you know it, it's hard i i don't know how other how the great the graciousness of other um ordination processes i do know that it's always this this red flag you know okay i'm gonna go to my psyche valve for my ordination process and what are they gonna find and and uh, am i really doing as well as i think i am and maybe they're gonna you know and and I hate, and it's hard, um, mostly because I, I think then your your mental health becomes a source of shame to you, even if you think you're probably okay, just a little bit of anxiety. Yeah, you're probably gonna. It becomes this thing of like, oh, like I hope I I hope it's not too bad, rather than you know I don't know what the other option would have been. I, um, you know I, you know I I don't there was a type of ministry that I probably wouldn't have been suited for with my OCD. And, and, um, so I'm glad for 
help. I'm glad for there to be processes where they don't just stick people with yeah. with a certain type of OCD in environments where they're not going to do well. But I think also you're, you know, it just becomes very easily. Am I good enough? Am I good enough um, to be in ministry? If maybe I can get good enough, if I can not be so depressed, not be so anxious, and and that can become just a a bad landscape of self just i don't know when you stare that closely into yourself hoping you can figure all this stuff out it can just get worse yeah so I, but, uh, I lost track of the question as as <laughs> is, uh so help me no, steer me steer me where we're going if i go off no course. i was i was actually going to bridge into nick's upcoming question and maybe a, a helpful way of getting there and what you just said too because this is also a theme or thread that runs through the book. And you've already talked about this too, kind of like the, like fighting the feelings. And sometimes mm-hmm. people like, Oh, like, why don't you fight them? Like, why don't you like tell those feelings go away or um, like keep preaching against them. Like keep, keep preaching oh. against the feelings and like all throughout the book. I mean, you, you'd say like, I'm, I'm not a counselor. Don't, don't take my, my yeah. <laughs> counseling advice. This is just somebody <laughs> who's, who's gone through this. Um, but if you, maybe you talk a little bit about, and again, kind of uh, like little pre thing here. It's like, this is not like medical advice, but what, when you were going through this, it wasn't so much like I have to fight these feelings. Maybe you talk through like, what, what was it like when you're going through these feelings? And it's not so much, I have to get rid of them, but I have to live with them. If you could right. talk through that yeah. too. Well, there's a kind of a, you know, I had to distinguish and it, and it was, took a lot of time and patience and still does between the kind of feelings my OCD is telling me versus what I'm, what I'm really feeling. Okay. Um, so th- that's, that's hard. Um, so um, sometimes I'm like, I don't think I'm actually upset. I think my brain's just upset uh, because it's not getting what it wants or it's an environment. Like the lying that part like, of what your brain was doing. It was yeah. telling you you're upset, but you weren't. Right. And I was, it's like, your brain's like something's wrong or, or like something bad's about to happen. And so that, that's more like a fog that I learned to move through or like I talk, I talk about it. It's just like a haunted house. Like, how do you, how do you leave a haunted house? And mm-hmm. if I was to sit there and try to punch every uh, intrusive thought or every feet, every alarm bell, whatever, anything that popped out at me and said, Oh, watch out. Something bad's about to happen or, or, Ooh, Ooh, watch out for this. Yeah. You know, that's no way to leave a haunted house. Everyone knows the way to leave a haunted house is you just walk out of it. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and so, um, learning how to walk past um, the OCD feelings. I, I make that, I try to be pretty clear. The OCD feelings are things, if you stand there and start shouting at them, if you, if you stand there and try to talk back to them all the time, then you're just trapped in there. And uh, I cannot tell you how many, you know, alarm bells or um, worries or thoughts or premonitions of doom that, that they're really, if you sit down and try to, negotiate you you've already lost you you really win by just walking by them hmm. uh, as if they're not really real and that takes time it takes a long time and but i think underneath that was the fact that like um i call them the the three uh, the three unbearable losses or the three hard feelings um having ocd like this it, it, you feel a loss of honor you feel like a loss of you don't loss of sense of self um, being afflicted for a long time um, creates despair. And I just talk about despair as a loss of meaning or purpose and fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, talk about the loss of honor, the loss of security and the loss of meaning as being really hard feelings, but, but you, you can't get rid of them by pride and lies. You can't just say, Oh, I didn't really lose, or I didn't, I, you know, I keep going back to the fact that for 30 years, 30 plus years, there was a John, me, mm-hmm. who had who had to handle this affliction and suffered and lost uh, meaningful relationships because of it, um, lost um, a secure sense of self because I was always fighting lies that I didn't even need to worry about, but I thought I did. Hmm. Those are those are things that those are losses that are hard to bear, even just the loss of knowing, okay, because of your OCD and the peculiar nature of it, now your, your ordination's in question. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't go away feeling like crap, you know, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, well, um, I guess, I guess I'm a, I guess I'm a dud. I guess I'm in the loser pile. Yep. And, 
wasn't good enough for this. And and I so I think about those losses as wounds that are hard and they need to be grieved, especially if it's happened over a series of time where you have to kind of have to acknowledge that um, aspects of this affliction have taken from you pieces of your life that hopefully you can get them back, but you did, you did really lose things. Hmm. But the, the thing is, um, Jesus mm-hmm. is the one who accounts for all losses and he, mm-hmm. he, get, he gives back honor. He walks us through a fear and, and he gives back meaning and purpose but waiting for him to do that, mm. waiting, <laughs> yeah. trusting in the promise yeah. of it, and then waiting for the re- for him to do it, and in the in the fullness of his return, you know, you you have to stand with those losses, and you have to say, you know, I did really lose where I thought my life was headed. I really did lose, um, you know, it's hard to enjoy life with OCD. That that's that's really hard. You, you don't feel like you're enjoying life as much as other people. That's that's a loss. And and learning to grieve it rather than run away from, run away from it. So that's the term I use for the howling boy, which is yep. the what I call the actual hard feelings, not the not the, yeah, the OCD. howling boy shows up quite a bit in this book. Yep. Yeah, I had to meet him. I had to talk to him. We had to we had to talk because he he needed to be at the Lord's table with yeah. me. You know, not cast and, out. Yeah, he he needed to. You know, he, the Lord's mercies were for him, and so a lot of that was just letting letting myself grieve or, or, you know, if, if, you know, I don't know if you, it, it's hard to, you know, to want to go to a graduation, to want to go to, to want to travel and you can't because it's too painful because your brain gets upset. And then you feel like you can't travel like other people. You feel like you can't go outside and be with people. You feel like you can't be social. You can't, it's harder. You're going through, it takes a, a ton of effort just, just to kind of put yourself out there and go to a party and and you know those things give meaning being with people gives meaning and if yeah. it's hard to be with people then man you got to grieve that a little bit and 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 hope the lord and pray for the lord and and ask the lord how he's going to give give you a life of meaning and purpose if if, if by promise now and fulfillment later but what does that look like and so yeah. i think that that's that's sort of what i meant is hmm. if i ran from if i ran from those losses and didn't face them then i was I wasn't being honest before the Lord, you know, I think that was important. Um, That's helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to bring up, talk about some of those terms that we've mentioned and how you respond to those based on the gospel. And, and you, you mentioned the howling boy. Uh, There's a few others that that if the audience had keen ears, they might've picked up on, but just to refresh on it, refresh it. There's um, some of those, some of those terms they're helpful. And you mentioned this in your book. And I'm not saying this. Uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of recapping what you said in the book that they're not meant to be literal, obvious, but it's your best way of describing what you're going through. So obviously the wilderness, you're not writing it while you're walking through the forest. <laughs> yeah, so, right. But, but uh, so for example, this, I mean, the, he could this, have been, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, no shame there if you were, but um, yeah, sometimes I was in an actual wilderness while I, <laughs> Was going was through the wilderness, wilderness of, of <laughs> yeah, OCD, yeah. but <laughs> physically uh, and mentally. But uh, yeah, some of the terms: the siren, the realm of ceaseless cognition, um, <clears throat> that howling boy you mentioned, the wilderness of uh, of history and affliction, the strangers, just to name a few. So, um, based on those terms in your experiences, I want to now focus on you as a Christian. You, you understand and know the gospel. You even explain to the, you even explain the gospel to others and God's using you in great ways. So how is this reality of Jesus in your life as your shepherd, your help, your hope, and more through it, uh, based on that gospel response how is how are you responding to these terms based on that reality of of a child of god yeah so kind of maybe make i want to make sure i'm answering the question you're asking and not the one i'm hearing if there's a difference so it's just kind of how do these terms coincide with the realities of the gospel mm-hmm. and yeah so I mean, what's helpful for like naming these terms too when you pronounce the gospel promises to these to these things as well and they're not yeah. going and i want to make for 
they're not going away. But yeah, now it's like, you're not you just have... saying this and it kind of vanquishes them as, as yeah. Thanos does. But it's like, no, like you're just you're you're yeah. proclaiming. You're not. That's what you're like. You're not running away from these things. You call them. This is what they are. And then you proclaim gospel promises to them. You're still walking through the wilderness, but you have yeah. Christ with you. So that, that's yeah. yeah, that that's a better answer to my question than I had. So I. <laughs> Uh, so we read your book too (laughs) yeah um it's it's just nice to know that um sometimes i wonder that the book was just too much and had too much going on but no there's a there's a basic i think spiritual journey and even that word sounds a little hokey but but i'll say it because i think i think it's in scripture yeah um you know even the passover meal the lord you know there's 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 all there's 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 these three sort of promises these three sort of things and so we need we need jesus the christ the crucified christ to to free us from bondage to to pride and lies or sin and that that is that is something that is total gift i mean it's all total gift but that sense of being delivered from a place of of bondage so for me the realm of ceaseless cognition is another word for pride it's kind of what pride looked like for me it was this tangled web of i think i can figure things out i think i can make things right yeah and for me pride is to say is that thing in us that says we can take back honor security and purpose and we can make things right on our own that's what we're gonna we're gonna Mm. depend on ourselves we're gonna make things right and we all find ourselves doing that like like to some extent yeah yeah and it's it's so it's so enmeshed with like real losses we don't want to lose like yeah if you find yourself wanting to have a snappy retort to someone who kind of sort of threw some shade at you with a weird comment that's just yeah. that thing in you it says no i'm taking back honor like i'm getting yeah. it back and um in that thing to, to to want to be in control of our yeah. circumstances lying for want... whatever it is or yeah um, yeah lust or whatever like you want to kind of bring some yeah we want to either not lose that shame by lying or you want to bring it to you by yeah by pride and and I think to to know that the and for me the siren is lies, and the realm of ceaseless cognition is is um, pride. They're they're I think pretty theologically sound oh, concepts, <laughs> but I but I had them in this sort of imaginative language. The realm of ceaseless cognition I think yeah. is a different way of talking about, particularly key to the OCD experience of trusting. You're sort of trusting in your compulsions, and you're also trusting that your brain isn't lying to you. And bad trust, you know, is a sort of <laughs> that that old heart we have. We can't really trust in the right thing. We're sort of helpless to trust in the right thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that's when you know hearing comes in. That you know by the proclam by the proclamation of the gospel, mercies of Christ, the 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 the, the freeing power of the shed blood for us releases us. And I that's why I go back to hearing all the time because I have to hear to trust in this guy and in hearing the promises of the gospel frees my trust to trust in Christ. And I experience that multiple times a day when I do the daily office, sometimes in mundane ways and sometimes in miraculous, beautiful ways. But to say, I, my trust has to be in this guy. And this is how I know to trust him. I can hear his promises. And um, and then to say, okay, now that I trust in him, um, I still feel the undertow of pride and lies. I still feel the pull of them. And apparently I always will. And mm-hmm. The, the undertow was always tugging on us. I think that's what it means to to live. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> is okay. Maybe sin has lost its domination over every aspect of our life, but man, is it pulling hard oh, yeah. on us? And um, gracious, and yeah. we're not totally free yet. You know, I, I no. you know, there's uh, we're, the, our trust is still being rescued. More and more of it being rescued, even from things we thought we were fine. Yeah, if our sin know? was gone, like that little tugboat wasn't continually pulling you. You would like that. The grace of Christ would kind of seem um a little less needed yeah yeah for sure and and i i think what was surprising to me was to find that when you leave pride and lies when you when i left the the siren which for me was just the ocd lying to me and um the compulsions um you walked i walked straight into suffering because um you pride and lies have a consoling effect Really, I mean, the, the, their job is to to give false consolation that we're okay and that we're going to be okay in these ways that actually we won't be. But to sort of walk out into, mm. um, you know, I had to walk out into symptoms that, like, my brain was still ready to talk to me about. He, my brain was still upset, um, and and it was still telling me lies. It was still sort of sending out the wrong alarm signals, 
and I had to sort of face them without my compulsions. That, that was a wilderness. That was like, okay, how do I live now? Mm -hmm. I can, I can, by hearing the gospel, I sort of am learning to not go into that hyper rumination. Hmm. But when I stop hyper ruminating, it's just really painful. And I mean, like a physical sensation in my brain, my brain's like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think everyone feels that feels that of just like, okay, now I have to face suffering and trouble and loss without my easy consolations that I had. I can't just run to this thing I used to run to. Oh. That's been taken off the table. At least today it is because I heard the gospel. Okay, how do I make it through suffering? And I think that's suffering and loss and these things that are that are there. And um, I think that's when I was learning what, okay, now that I trust in Christ by hearing, I I, I trust him with things. I trust him with big feelings that are hard. I trust him with suffering that isn't going anywhere. And I, I was stumbling towards prayer and, um, you know, that was the thing. And then that was this other thing of where am I, where am I headed? And the idea of being headed towards the fullness of his return when he, when he full, fully cleanses, you know, I say, he, he says the full amen to his death and resurrection, like pride and lies gone, you know, trouble and loss over, everything lost given back um suffering dealt with those sort of that the joy of that day it's like well how do i head there and for me it was learning to be present in my life again learning to offer myself well to the things at hand so i kind of took the ocd symptoms and created a new map for myself where i was still honest about the symptoms but also was really wanted to be an orthodox christian <laughs> mm -hmm. and not just make up stuff but to say where where can we hope that to head and i just it took the whole book for me to understand that um i could trust in christ and walk through the suffering of the the symptoms um that he didn't need more than my trust and mm -hmm. and i think maybe sometimes in the evangelical world, we think that, and maybe this goes back to a former question, that faith sort of, I kind of always thought that faith was just like a being in a good mood. Yeah. Or like special Always joyful, feelings. always rejoicing, yeah. always being happy. And uh, I learned that that's a much smaller thing for me. Uh, trust, despite feelings, despite mm -hmm. standing with those losses and, and standing, withstanding the OCD feelings, the, the lies you know it's it's a it's a more it's a more tender thread than i thought it wasn't this sort of fireworks display of positivity and encourage but but there was but there's a toughness to it mm. when i found out okay trusting leaning on this depending on this person that his promises are true that his spirit wants to lead me through and out of these lies into my life i believe that and i have a means of grace by which to access that um, but it's, it's not the same as, um, as what I think I was thought I would, was told to expect. Maybe that to be mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. yeah sometimes important. throughout the book, you, you say like, sometimes like I'd rather not these feelings <laughs> and not Christ than Christ and these feelings, but I got Christ in these feelings instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Just some, just some, before my last question, just some things I was hearing um and and kind of interpreting out loud you know in my mind as you were talking is just you're suffering with christ in truth you you turned away from the lies you know the lies that were making you a slave to them and they might promise comfort but you're 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 turning towards even though it's going to be suffering it's suffering with christ because mm -hmm. it's in truth and you know you can find things like that in second corinthians 12 and all throughout the psalms <laughs> all throughout the psalms yeah which you i can, think you you leaned on pretty heavily during a lot of your yeah. recovery too yeah, i mean to live is to live is christ to die is gain paul says so you're i mean as a brother, as brothers of you, I mean, I don't know if you see it, but I, I see, I see courage with Christ's help. Obviously, that's the whole point. You're depending on Christ rather than yourself. But I see that it's good. You're you're going against the grain of what 
you know, the, the lies and uh, are trying to tell you and you're, you're choosing maybe a harder path of suffering, but a eternally good, eternally good one with promise with Christ. And so, and I, and I yeah, it, it's, um, you know, sometimes I was thinking like, well, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I got it. You know, you always wonder, maybe I, maybe I'm a little too bleak about the discipleship path. Maybe there's, maybe there is, you know, faith and mental health don't, aren't always bosom buddies. And, and yeah. a lot of times our faith becomes, or, or our perceived lack of faith. If, if we had faith, why, why would we feel this way? Or why would yeah. we feel bad like this? And I was like, man, these guys, this, the, if, if there was anyone I was sure was my friend to my affliction, it was Jesus. I was just so sure of it. Hmm. And to to stick as close as I could to him by hearing and the attempts of prayer and through his spirit. And I was just like, and and just like, I just, I, how close can I get to this guy? Because he's my only friend in my affliction. And I just I tell people, I would, I don't know what I would do if I thought, if I if I didn't know Jesus was the friend of of you know my mind was not my friend but Jesus was the friend was mm -hmm. my friend and and I think that can be hard to communicate because sometimes I think you know for me it, it didn't maybe look like other people I sometimes like well maybe I should spend more time talking against negative thoughts and I was just pretty sure that those. I came pretty clear. Those negative thoughts, they're just a fog and me and Jesus are going to, are going to walk out of that fog and it's just going to burn right off. And maybe it'll take a long time and maybe the whole day I'll stick in, I'll be in the fog. But if I start flailing around in this fog, trying to fight negative thoughts with positive thoughts, I, it will end up back in that psych ward. Hmm. And I think that's the peculiar nature of OCD is what they tell you is if you try to fight thoughts with thoughts, you will, you will end up back here. And, um, and maybe in other things, it's not the same. Maybe I, you know, I, I kind of wish I'm like, oh, I wish maybe we should do more, you know, fighting good thinking with bad thinking or, or bad theology with good theology. But for me, I just had to walk past things that weren't true and find a way to just quietly move a different direction than, than what my brain was saying without flailing around and saying, well, I'm going to prove to myself I'm an actual Christian. No, no, no. And, yeah. Cause yeah. I, that's just like pouring pouring gasoline on a fire man you just get it's more thoughts <laughs> more thoughts thoughts thighting. and i was like i need i need an actual jesus to get me out of these thoughts i don't need more thoughts yeah and that's i think maybe what came with filling my life with these rhythms of hearing mm -hmm. in scripture less mm -hmm. of me th cogitating and cognition mm -hmm. and more just hearing more mm -hmm. just rhythms and i was like okay i'm slowly getting a sense that mm. i can walk away from this these negative thoughts rather than always have to turn around and fight them hmm. yeah they're not if they're i'm actually saying they're less real if mm. they were real i would fight them but because they're just a fog huh. i get i get to walk away true yeah and i and i don't know if other people experience that that don't have ocd but and, yeah. yeah i'm not a huh. therapist so it maybe <laughs> yeah. i'll take it but but you know, they pretty much told me if if you want to fight bad thinking with good thinking, you're going to end up right back here. And I was like, mm, okay. yeah, huh. I I see the the beauty in surrendering to Christ because our God can empathize with our suffering because He still has scars right now. Mm -hmm. He suffered for us. Our God came to Earth to suffer for us, and you're surrendering to the God that suffered for you, and that's why He's our friend and our Savior. So. My last question here, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about suffering through the experience of memory, history, and affliction, as you mentioned in the book. In terms you personally describe, uh, to get more specific, how does your personal journaled quote I wanted to pull out here, you leaned on through the years and you jotted it down in the book. Here's the, here's the quote, suffering is a mystery by which we are driven either to humility or despair yeah um how's that helped you that quote man it, it was writing it you know sometimes you're like do i get to write that and still be a christian or do mm. i get to write mm. i imagine we look at the psalms a lot and say like david are you are you sure you want to say that <laughs> 
Don't you want to put a happy ending on this psalm here? You kind yeah, of like Psalm eighty eight. I don't think you want to end that where you just ended that. <laughs> yeah, but I, for me, and you know, for me and my friends that are that struggle, man, the honesty of the psalms. I mean, the prophet Jeremiah. For, I mean, he had this 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 humdinger of a line. <laughs> I, I, I think it was semi related to that journal quote. I think I I was reading Jeremiah as I was writing that, and he, he said. Why did I come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? And I thought, man, what if we put that on a, you know, you have the nice Bible verses and stuff. Yeah. What if put on a coffee Jer- mug and just Ho- yeah, hobby lobby, <laughs> hobby yeah. lobby? Where are you uh, at? <laughs> yeah, right. But I thought, okay, what makes the worship? And I was like, well, if if that's if you're asking God that, then it's worship and it's okay. And and the Holy Spirit, you know, we we don't have to be so careful that, of offending God, you know, that we can't be <laughs> honest. Yeah. And certainly if he knows our suffering um, and and he knows, um, you know, he knows what what it's like, mm-hmm. um, then then we have a friend in the question. And and, um, mm. and so I I wrote that sometimes I, w- I would write things and they would kind of I don't know if you've you know written a poem or a song or something that, or done something creative. And it's like sometimes it's like looking back at you. And you're like. I did not know I could create that. And now that I created it, it's kind of staring back at me and confronting me with itself. And I don't know what to make of it. Hmm. Um, you know, a beautiful poem, a beautiful line. Some, I would write sentences and be like, do I believe that? And if I believe it, that's pretty, man, that's okay. I need to, that's a pretty <laughs> interesting sentence I just wrote. Yeah. And that yeah. was one of them. And I think the question was, um, what was really killing me, I think was the question. Um suffering is just so hard and the the people i work with it's just not a question you get to answer just with a proposition of theology or even a verse i mean verses are helpful don't give me promises or promises um but um suffering can sometimes feel like it's just the final word you know Mm -hmm. suffering and death there's the final word on you is you're just going to suffer and it's going to take all meaning and purpose out of your life and this is all there is and people with chronic pain, I know, have those questions. I think my my issue being chronic in the sense of not going anywhere. Yep. Um, okay, is this going to take all meaning, purpose, fulfillment, and joy out of my life? Because it sometimes feels like it has the power to. And um, I think ultimately the quote's about trusting Christ with suffering. And I think in order to trust Christ with suffering, we sort of, and I'll just speak for myself, I had to face it. I had to face the wilderness of it without pride and lies, always sort of masking it or getting rid of it um, or shrouding it. I had to say, okay, like I will suffer and it's going to be really hard. The question is, is Christ can, 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 is Christ trustworthy with our suffering and what does it look like to trust him with it? Um, Especially if our suffering is chronic, especially if it's, if it, remove significant portions of joy and fulfillment and 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 then those questions become incredibly um urgent i think um where how am i going to be okay i think that's the question and for me ocd doesn't stop me from living and um has it stopped me from once i had a handle on it um once i had i thought a sense of the Lord's navigating, being my friend with me through it. Okay. It can make me suffer, but it can't, it can't tell me what life's about and it can't decide what my life's about. You know, that goes back to, I think the thing you said at the beginning is who is, who is he and who am I and where am I going and what am I doing? Okay. Trust unites me with Christ. Christ clothes, shame walks me through the suffering and will give me back a life of meaning and purpose. Even if I don't feel it today, I can still, by the means of grace, trust it or try to trust it. And ultimately, I just felt over five years of working through it that I got significant portions of my life back, little little fighting for scraps, fighting mm-hmm. for the joy of things again. And so I was like, okay, suffering's not the final word. But what's so hard is I wouldn't go tell somebody that who's dying, <laughs> you know, or I would be careful how I said it. I'd be like, yeah. you know what? suffering ain't that bad you know i you know <laughs> yeah. I, I don't but i think there's going to go down well yeah there's also a sense of you know my you know my dad had pneumonia real bad a couple a few years ago and 
And uh, when they took him communion, the pastor took him communion. It was a powerful thing because it was saying, you know, this pneumonia may not. He, he's fine. He didn't die of it, but it was a bad case of it, and it was yeah. scary enough. And it was like, okay, the the this this is not the final word. It's the Lord's the final word, and His death and resurrection is the final word, and it covers you, and it it it, it, it wins. It's the one. It's the thing that wins. But speaking to that, speaking, living in that, in the midst of it. Man, what a challenge. And so you end up writing things like that about <laughs> a mystery by which we are driven to humility or despair, which I still kind of cringe. I'm like, you know, that's that's 30-year-old John talking, not 34-year-old John. I wouldn't have said it like that. Um, I don't know if that gets at what you're saying, but it, it, yeah, it, it's a... Uh... Yeah. I, yeah, I, I see that. Yeah, and that's... I can't say the same thing, but it's more or less when I preach on Sunday and I write something and I speak it out and i was like i'm just the one who said that and that's what i have to believe and i was like that that came from me and i'm the that's one who's it. speaking and all these other people are listening to me and believing the words that i say like do i believe the words that i just said <laughs> that, that 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 definitely didn't come from me um so in a, in a, yeah in a slightly kind of smaller way but it's i i, I kind of yeah i kind of see that so last uh last two questions i'm gonna kind of mush together all right um, i'm ready for it yeah ready so mush yeah, even the title of the book, and we we haven't really even talked about the title, and I know that can go publishers, the author kind of goes with it, or a mishmash of the two, um, but it's probably not what most Christians think. Like, okay, when I am a Christian, I have a quiet mind to suffer with. Like, now I have a mm-hmm. victorious mind to bring to Christ. But yeah, maybe as as before, we get to our final final question. But this mishmash. But what do you mean that's as a as a Christian, what like what's for lack of a better way of saying this, like what's glorious, redemptive about a quiet mind to suffer with? Yeah, maybe you know, I, I don't. I think we uh, we have those moments. I think trust is for me is is this gift by which we we don't always have to run to ourselves or lies, but we can just sit with the truth that Jesus did what He did. And, and that can be a really painful kind of quiet. Um, for me, the quiet was just when I stopped, when I learned how to stop my compulsions, that was when I said, okay, I, I can actually not engage in a compulsion in my mind. And, but is my mind upset about it? Yes. So I don't mean that kind of quiet. And I don't mean that, that, and, and can I sit with, the intensity of of a hard feeling without running to narrative i particularly talk about how mm-hmm. you know if you're really upset the, i know people are upset when they're angry and then they start we have all these like we just creates a word cloud of like reasons why this person's wrong and this person's wrong and i just want to <laughs> sit with that person and say i think i think this person took honor from you and that feels unbearable and you can't sit with it and and what would it be like to sit with it or i think this is deeply scary because you really have no foothold here and you want to run off into plans and strategies. And ultimately like, we don't really know what's going to happen. And then sitting with that, with the Lord in that, like that's really hard or, you know, and and so I talk about the quiet of just understanding through hearing who Jesus is. And um, there's a moment where, you know, for me, it was the silence at the foot of the cross. It is finished. He did it. There's nothing, any intrusive thought or, thing gets to say over this word Mm. and but um the quiet doesn't mean the that the room's quiet or that your (laughs) head's quiet Mm -hmm. i think it maybe it's the quiet of um just that painful decision to say i i think i think i can hear promises and not respond (laughs) figure it out and make it right and not go into flailing mode and but to sit to sit in that that's that's the quiet mind i know to suffer with so I try to tell people it's it's not the, I don't mean that I'm this Zen person with zero thoughts running in my head. I think for me it's it's um and I, I keep going into the weeds with the OCD stuff, so I'll just be real quick about it. But Do you, it. I, yeah. I, I I basically learned that there was the thoughts that were just going to be happening because they were my you know, an experience provided by my brain free of charge. You know, there's a movie in my head that I don't get to choose. Mm-hmm. And thoughts come in. I don't get to choose them. They're non-voluntary. They're just there. My brain's just wacky, throws that stuff out. Now, when I sit there and argue with it and 
and try to figure it out and 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 push back on it then there is a sense in which i am now adding my thinking to those thoughts and and the quiet is not the quiet of no thoughts it was the absence of um, being able somehow to quit ruminating and i want to tell people yeah not not an instant skill uh no <laughs> <laughs> you know I, well, i'm not just you know and and so i don't want to tell people you know just you know just stop your compulsion yeah, once you hear the gospel like it's just gonna go away <laughs> And I think it was a quiet, like a little, a little seed that I gradually was beginning to figure out what it was like to live without my compulsions, mm -hmm. especially because they were me ruminating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think if you take from that, the idea of, I mean, if someone throws some, I call it about people throwing shade, if people have defamed you, slandered you to your face in an environment where you want to be cons regarded, not is not uh flinging it back not you know not raising up and, and getting vengeance and retaliation sitting with the quiet of just mm. okay this is a loss that christ will cover and not all the time sometimes you do need to defend your reputation but you know by and large especially like, if you're on twitter you gotta you gotta defend <laughs> gotta, your reputation you gotta but, defend you know, it like that kind of quiet where you're like oh wow like i don't always have to to charge out and fix sure. this but it's really uncomfortable to not to that kind of quiet is <laughs> ah. man. That That's the little thing I got from the gospel that, that man, I just, it's, it means everything to me that, that it, it gets rescued by hearing. I don't have to generate it, but like, I'm just like, man, yeah, I need to hear some promises. I need some good promises coming my way to, <laughs> yeah. to sit with the Lord again and, and yeah. who he says he is. But is it kind of like saying <clears throat> um, there are times when you just will choose to, not have a dialogue with your thoughts yeah be like nope not going down there not answering you which i can't imagine was I'm, easy the first time you're like no yeah, this, this not, sounds fun i'm not making yeah. this sound easy but you're yeah you're and you you would say i'm giving this to christ christ take yeah. over please yeah. which on the but, front end like you said is like that's the suffering routes other yeah. like rather than fighting them with pride and yeah. whatever they with everything else well and to you know i, I think it's so hard because not hard, but, you know, for me, I have, you know, the obsession quality, things that I'm not trying to think of. They're just there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just have to say, you know, you're my bad roommate today, but <laughs> I'm, I got a, I got a day I got to have. And, and it's not including arguing with you. Mm. And, um, but you know, nothing about it felt natural. Um, you know, nothing about it felt and I think that maybe that's that's some of why I think is a helpful nuance for people. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that Christians feel a burden with bad thoughts that they need that they're always responsible for fixing bad thoughts. Oh, I shouldn't have thought that about my mm -hmm. spouse. Oh, I shouldn't have thought that about my mom. Well, you know, maybe you should and shouldn't have. Maybe it's not even something you created. Maybe it's just your brain just farting, you know, brains to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's there's a there's a sense in which we kind of over mm -hmm. esteem, which is a, a, a you know, over esteem our thoughts. We think our thoughts are telling us something meaningful always when mm. a lot of it's junk anyway. Mm. And so, um, okay, how do I move through junk? If I pick up every piece of junk and shout at it, then I'm getting, not getting out of this dumpster. But how <laughs> no. do I, yeah. but I, but it's really hard because thoughts can be really persuasive and they can come with some big, you know, it's, I always tell people it's such a gradual sense of freedom that I felt nothing overnight. And, um, and, you know, gradually always pointing myself, what is my day going to be about? Like, what am I actually offering today? If I sit here and fight with myself, I'm not going to be involved in my life. And I, Jesus really wants me involved in my life. Hmm. And I'm never going to figure this out if this person likes me or not. It's just a doomed endeavor. I do will not know. I will not know. And in light of that, what is my day going to be about? And hmm. praying about it. Lord, where am I going? I, I use the Lord's Prayer all the time just to reorient me. Like, your will be done. Where is that? Because right now I'm sitting in my thoughts and your kingdom come point me to that because I don't know where that's going and, and trusting the Holy Spirit to gradually hmm. lead our attention away from where our home base feels like it is. And just and it's like an everyday journey. I I feel I don't wake up. I wake up doing it again. I wake up trapped in ruminations, gradually let out by hearing through prayer toward what I offer and and so it's just this little thread. I keep telling my friend, a little thread is all you need. Just a little sense of I'm heading somewhere with the Lord.
and, and I don't have to sit here and just attack everything that's coming through my head because some of it, a lot of it, 99% of it is not voluntary. It's just my brain. It's just static. I just need to learn that it's mm-hmm. static. And I don't know. <clears throat> that's me rambling about the OCD journey. No, but, that, is, you know. that is beautiful. And that's actually good for this, just for kind of a last uh, send off for those who are listening, either either those who are listening to you and maybe they don't have the fullness. Some of them do like, Oh, this is exactly what I go through. Or someone's like, Oh, I, like I'm continuum. I, I go through this sometimes or it's a little bit for, for those who are listening. I was like, yeah, this is the thing I, you don't, I don't deal with, but like, I have, I have, I have pieces of this. How, like, how do I, how do I deal with this? And for those, for churches, for pastors, for members of churches who, I mean, you know, like everybody knows somebody who deals with something like this whether it be the fullness of, of your um, mental illness or anybody else's mental illness. Um, yeah. A hope for those who have this or something like this and those advice for those who have them in their lives, people who, who have this, who are the, in their lives. Yeah. I, I think people feel like they need to be experts before they can love somebody well with a mental illness. I would say two th- one thing is mental illness no matter what, uh, it's extremely hard to find language for. And so a lot of it is just uh, the person experiences it as chaos and, and learning to learning to be with them in the chaos, I think is the question. And um, so don't be Job's friends is what you're saying. No, no. And it, but you know, what's so beautiful. I found, you know, um, and we, we are, uh, friends in my ministry with some people who just have severe schizophrenia and yeah. you think okay like how am i going to interact with this person but the you know when we're giving regard turning our face to people like there's deep soul needs those deep losses like you don't have to be an expert in anything to to turn your face and give regard to somebody yeah. play i mean the most deeply beautiful shalom sign of the kingdom i've ever seen is me sitting playing uno with a guy who's just got he's got a lot of troubles but but i'm looking in his face and Mm -hmm. i'm saying i'm saying with that look i'm saying you know like i you exist to me you matter Mm -hmm. to me Mm -hmm. and we're gonna play this uno game Mm -hmm. and um those things are deeply healing um to people because it you know it restores honor it's face to face and the lord turning his face to us at the cross i think is is it's deeply tied to that the lord decided to turn his face to us and so you know looking at your friend and saying you know i have no idea and i'm not even going to burden you with you telling me what your mental illness is like Mm -hmm. and i'm not going to try to fix it but would it be good to go to a movie Mm -hmm. like do you do if i pick you up would you would you want to go to coffee with me and we could just those things are deeply healing in ways i think we don't understand Mm -hmm. um keeping people company to say, it seems like getting out the door is really hard. Is there a way that me keeping you company could make it easier? Hmm. You know, we, we, we can actually meet deep soul needs without being experts ever. Um, and, um, and man, when I look in the face of my, my friend with severe schizophrenia and just say his name and just smile and just like, how's the coffee? Like, (laughs) it's good, man. Like, did you put cream in it? Yeah, man, it's good. Yeah, man, it's good to see you. And it's like something beautiful is happening that speaks of the gospel without us having to be experts. So I would just recommend to that that you're not you're not so flat footed with not knowing the ins and outs of mental health that you can't restore honor by by turning your face to people and being willing to just sit and not fix and keep company. And uh, and those are the things that I've seen. The, the things that matter to me, I, I, the kind of a last note, the uh, a, a, a nurse, it's in the book, but a nurse yep. walked with me when I was in the I was, psych ward. I didn't and bring she, that up during the interview, but I remember yeah, reading this. But she, she, the two things she, she said to me was, what did you do before you got here? And what do you want to do after? And I just, I just broke down crying because I didn't think I had a future if I was here. And I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, and it seemed like I didn't have a past either that <clears> I, was just, I was just stuck here. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, why do you like the Psalms? Or like, tell mm-hmm. me about your wife. And um, she walked with me. I, I'm a pacer. I was pacing back and forth in the hallways. Just this mm-hmm. big guy in a robe, just pacing. And this <laughs> little old nurse just <laughs> keeping up with my stride. And 
her decision to to turn her face towards me was the difference between recovery and I mean I'm convinced that something of like the fullness of the cross was present in that moment because she decided not to treat me as a patient but to talk learn my name ask me what my life was like and 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 uh and walk I give you permission me. to look to the future too not just yeah. like hey I'm here and people like people treating you like you're here saying hey you've you've got something after this even if yeah. she didn't say it she kind of like assumed it yeah she and yeah, that was the walking with me was a sign of hope. It was a sign of the resurrection. I'm walking with you. We're headed somewhere. The spirit, yeah. the Lord's, has given us a spirit of His resurrection. We're walking, and um, and I, I sometimes I wonder if I'll ever see her again because I would just give her a big old hug if I find her at Burger King or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just I just say, man, that 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 meant the world to me, and so, and I think yeah. it it means the world to to people that are friends of people with mental illness that you, you can give regard freely without knowing a thing about what it's like for them hmm. and, and with not needing to be an expert and, um, and sitting with them in their confusion and chaos and, and just saying, I'll be here. I'll, I'll sit with you on the couch. You, you know, I'll, that's all I have to do. That's if, if that's if, and, and it means the world to people, um, it meant the world to me. So, hmm. and it's deeply theological. I could talk for days about, you know, absolutely. The Lord's decision to to be with us, to be to, to yeah. give, to turn His face, you know, I yep. love it. Yep. And um, so don't downplay the mundane and don't think you have to be an expert. That would be my advice. Hundred percent. No, that's Amen. Yeah, that is wonderful. Yeah, and that's that's um, that's some gospel hope. I think I think people desperately need to hear for those who have mental illness and those who don't have mental illness. Just. <laughs> being with them and and talking to them and, and not feeling like you have to be an like an expert or answer every question it's just yeah to to treat them as a human as somebody that is an image of god um because that's not something we treat people especially if they look and sound and kind of think differently than we do we yeah kind of it can be hard it's a yeah. risk sometimes to just play uno with somebody who's got <clears throat> something going on in the brain but maybe yep. maybe he plays uno maybe he wants coffee maybe we can sit yeah, and a lot of oh. times you can. You know, yeah. that's what's beautiful. The, yeah, the Lord's mercies are there. I'll call out my wife. I, I'll admit this is not something I'm good at. I mean, I when I I walk my dog in the the streets of Santa Ana, which is Central Orange County, not a great place to be in Orange County. Um, but walk my dog and th- as much as I can when when because we have a a ton of homeless and and there's a crack house like right down the street from where we live. Um, but I mean, it is hard, and I'll admit I'm not always great at this. My, my wife is fantastic at this and i don't know if it's a nurturing aspect in her or she just she just sees everybody for who they are until she gave out rain jackets when the we had the uh tropical storm coming through here um just asking people how they're doing it was it was uh it it kind of showed me like yeah this is something we can all do um but yeah thank thank you john for coming on our show for writing this book um i can imagine it was both cathartic but also scary writing through this book and like, am I really going to talk about this? Is this going to bring this stuff yeah. back up or are people going to relate with me? So yeah, thank you for, for doing this, for writing this, for being so genuinely vulnerable um, and, and giving um, people words for some of this stuff, categories for some of this stuff. Like this is okay to talk about. You can be a Christian and mentally ill at the same time and they don't cancel, cancel each other out. Uh, in fact, you can you can bring your mental illness to Jesus. It's like, yeah, I'll mm-hmm. take that too. Um, mm-hmm. Not just kind of bring yourself up as a cleaned up, perfect specimen. But yeah, thank you so much for writing this and coming on our show. It was an honor to talk about it. It's an honor to be here. And uh, yeah, and if there's anyone listening with OCD, the Lord loves you. Mm-hmm. He's the friend of your mind, not 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 the enemy. Always the friend. And uh, if you don't hear it, hear it from me because I. I know that to be true. So anyway, that was my shout out to anyone out there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Of course. Yeah. Thank you so much.